Good morning. Happy Father's Day. I'm glad that you're here. Great place to be if you're a father. We're glad that you're here. I read a book recently, just to, actually just finished it a few weeks ago, called The War Below by James Scott. And it's actually, it's a very interesting book. It's a, it's a book, if you like history books about World War II, that's, what it's, uh, that's the genre of it. And it, it talks about the submarine war that happened uh, on the Pacific. And the reason it was so significant was when uh, the attack happened against Pearl Harbor, Everybody knows that story and how that wiped out uh, so many of, the, uh, of uh, the American ships, but they didn't touch any of the subs at all. That was another, there was a base right next to that. They just didn't touch it, didn't touch the depot, any of the stuff associated with it. So we ended up really having all of our subs, and that was for the first, for the next year, year and a half, that was really the focal point of our naval war against uh, against the Japanese at that time. And so uh, he details in very interestingly ways uh, this, this battle that's going on between subs and how it, how it all works. And, but, he, but he makes an interesting point. He says that the number one reason America did so much better than the Japanese because they actually had great, great uh, training. They had great... Uh, uh, ships. They had, they had terrific stuff, probably as good or better than America. But the distinguishing factor was the way we mentored our captains. And so what the Japanese did is they had their best captains forward and they just kept them in the game and they kept using them for obvious reasons. They were their best. They did the same thing with the pilots. Just kept them, kept them on the, on the front lines. With the Americans, what they decided to do is they, they took their very best captains and their pilots. They, they would take them after about five or six months out of the front lines and put them back in schools, training those people that were coming up next to be captains and pilots. And, and they had this cyclical thing. So at first that wasn't all that, it wasn't as, as good of a strategy because you had their veterans, their very best captains against people coming right out of school. But as the months went on, as th eventually their, even their best captains would, would die, their best pilots would die, and then they had nobody trained up. And so they ended up starting to getting desperate, doing kamikaze things, all these kinds of things, because they, they had very, they had no mentorship. That was the underpinning of it all, it, because they only saw short term. Long term is what the Americans were looking for. They were saying, long term, we need something that's going to be sustainable. I wanted to talk to you today about mentorship uh, in light of Father's Day. Because I think mentorship is so important that in the, in the immediate, it is easier to do life, just do it ourselves. Just, you want a job done, do it, you know, right, do it yourself. But if we are in this for the long haul, we want to really have big impact. We need to buy in to leadership, I mean to mentorship, which is a form of leadership, but it's mentorship. So I wanted to just address that with Father's Day, and and uh, you know Father's Day, <clears throat> not it's really not like Mother's Day, but just for dudes, because you're, Mother's Day's different. You know, Mother's Day, everybody gets you know takes mom out to like a great restaurant. For dad, you know, they just give him some burgers and say, "Hey, go cook these on the grill, Dad." <laughs> <laughs> That's fundamentally different in my book, right? <laughs> Mother's Day, everybody gathers around mom, gets up real close. Father's Day, they just give him the remote, say, you know, go watch the basketball game, dad, you know. It's just, it's, it's different, right? And so Father's Day and Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, uh, sometimes we just, uh, I think it's a time to really, recognize the importance of dads that they don't some they're kind of like the unsung heroes to me you know a lot of times we you know we have like heroes athletic stars or politicians or rock stars or movie stars and to me there's no person who has more influence on on people and on our country than a father 
they play a tremendous role. Mark Twain said this. He said, when I was a boy of around 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in just seven years. <laughs> my kids are about that age, so I'm, I'm, I'm right there. But uh, you know, a lot of times, it's, fathers aren't kind of given the recognition. It's just like, well, what do you know? I saw this in a magazine recently. It's various stages uh, on how a, fa- a child views their father. He said, at age four, a little child says, my daddy can do anything. It's age seven. My daddy knows a lot, a whole lot. Age eight, well, my father doesn't know quite everything. At age 12, well, naturally my father doesn't know that either. At 14, they say, father is so hopelessly out of date. At 21, my dad is so completely out of it. At 26, well, he knows a little bit, but not too much. At 30, I must find out what dad thinks about this. At 35, well, that's a good idea, but let's see what dad thinks first. At age 50, they say, what would dad have thought about that? At age 60, you know, my dad knew literally everything. Just changing perspectives. And, you know, there's a perspective for dads to change about themselves. There's also a perspective that we, if you're not a dad, that maybe you are being challenged to think a little differently about your dad. And being a good dad, being a good mentor is not all about just being the most intelligent, you know. Intelligence isn't everything. It's like that story of the, the, uh, the airline, four guys were in this plane and the pilot gets on the intercom since the plane's going down. He jumps out with his parachute, but they only have three parachutes. Little, uh, boy scout has them all. And the first guy comes up, he goes, well, I am a great surgeon. I, help people all over the, the world with my skills. I need one of those parachutes. So he grabs the parachute, he jumps out. And the next guy comes up, he goes, I'm the smartest man in the world. And so I help people all over where they need my knowledge. He grabs one, he jumps out. The last guy, he's a father. He just comes up, he goes, you know, I'm, I'm a dad, but my kids are grown up and I'm older now. You have your whole life in front of you. Why don't you take that last parachute? Little Boy Scout goes, well, actually, there's two parachutes still. The smartest man in the world, he took my backpack. (laughs) So the point of that being, it's not all about intelligence. Sometimes there's just being willing to lay your life down, being willing to come in and just serve. And that can make a big difference. Sometimes it makes the biggest difference. We need commitment when it comes to mentoring as well. Our country needs that. People, we need that. I mean, you know, the Marines have, you know, a few good men. We need a few godly mentors. People that are willing to stand into the fray. Who are willing to be courageous when everybody else is fleeing. You know, more and more studies find that that there is the social ills that we see, which of course are all over, are, are connected to our family upbringing go to any counselor they'll tell you you know what's your family of origin and it's many social ills come from the lack of parental mentoring specifically the dad I read this article called the invisible dad it said many Americans many American men are disconnected from family life and society is paying the price consider two of the most serious problems crime and teenage pregnancies studies show that the most reliable predictor of these behaviors is not income not race but it's family structure. Pregnant girls and criminal boys tend to come from fatherless families. An astonishing 70% of imprisoned U.S. minors have spent at least part of their lives without their fathers. Then the article goes on, it says, without men around as role models, adolescent boys create their own rites of passages. Like maybe getting a girl pregnant or dealing drugs. Throughout history, men have been torn from their families by war, disease, and death. But now, in America, men are choosing to disconnect from family life on a massive scale and a far higher rate than other industrial countries. Men are drifting away from family life. And then it closes by saying, and we are in danger of becoming a fatherless society. And we see that writing on the wall. And, 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 and it, it's, it's very, uh, compared to other industrialized nations, it is really bad here, here in America. Part, and I think part of it is 
we have embedded in our American psyche this ideal, this American ideal, this American, you know, I, I get to pursue happiness. And there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of life, liberty, and, and happiness. But that's different than the pursuit of selfishness. And sometimes our happiness is really just, an ex, you know, it's just, we're not willing to, to make the hard call. Sometimes life doesn't always deliver happiness. Sometimes there's going through some tough times, working through some values that you believe in, even though, you know, it doesn't bring immediate happiness. So sometimes we don't think of the long-term repercussions that want to happen. You know, we just think, well, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting respect around here. I'm not being, I'm not getting the kind of uh, love I deserve and these kinds of things. And then we just think, well, you know, my kids will, will do okay without me. They'll, they're resilient. They'll bounce back. Well, consider this letter that was written to Ann Landers, <coughs> somebody who was called himself Second Thoughts about some choices that he made. It says, Dear Ann Landers, 10 years ago, I left my wife and four teenagers to marry my secretary with whom I've been having an affair. That's not very original, is it? He says, that was my comments, not his. Uh, I felt I couldn't live without her. When my wife found out about this, she went to pieces. We were divorced. My wife went to work and did a good job educating the boys. I gave her the house and part of my retirement fund. I'm fairly happy in my second marriage, but I'm beginning to see things in a different light. It hit me when I was a guest at my eldest son's wedding. That's all I was, a guest. I'm no longer considered part of the family. My first wife knew everyone present, and they showered her with affection. She remarried, and her husband has been taken inside the circle that was once ours. They gave the rehearsal dinner and sat next to my sons and their sweethearts, and I was proud to have a young, pretty wife at my side, but it did not make up for the pain when I realized that my children no longer love me. They treat me with courtesy, but there was no affection or real caring. I miss my sons, especially around the holiday times. I'm going to try to build some bridges, but the prospects don't look too promising after being out of their lives for 10 years. It's going to be difficult re-entering now that they have a stepdad they like. I'm writing in the hope that others will consider the ramifications before they jump. Just sign me second thoughts in Pennsylvania. And so this guy didn't think about the long-term consequences. And so often when we're not happy with our present life, we don't, we don't really project out. We can't think very far out. Galatians says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And so if you've made... If you're, if you're here and you've, you're a, a man, you've, you're married, you've made wedding vows, you don't run away when things get difficult. Those were serious vows before God. You know, if, if somebody, if there was a, a, a man in, in battle and ran away when the fighting got fierce, you would call him a coward, Right? Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a, and if those are, if, for, if I called some of you guys cowards, those would be fighting words, right? Hey, you coward. Hey, man, who do you think you are? <laughs> right? But I would say that if you, if you run away when things get t difficult out of your marriage, you are worse than a coward. But if you stick in there, in my book, you are a hero. You're a hero. More than any rock star or movie star politician, you're a hero, and you're needed. You know, Andy, but it's hard to be a father today. Well, I know. I have three kids, three boys. It's not been easy. You know, I've, I've been married 27 years. Not every day was super happy. <laughs> Whee, I'm married. <laughs> it's not how it goes. <laughs> I get it. It's hard. And I'm talking to myself as much as you. I, I, I need the same challenge. I'm going to stick in there. I'm staying in. I made some serious vows. One of the reasons why fathers are so important is they are a direct line to their father in heaven. Many, many people, they, especially kids when they're young, they form their thoughts about who God is by their experience with their father. 
I'm not, I don't mean to diminish the role of the mom. Mom plays a, a, a huge role, but today is Father's Day, right? So you give me a little room here. And so it's, it's, an important, it's an important thing we do. You know, it's interesting that fathers, we tend to think that they're kind of the tough guy and they, you know, call the toughness out of their kids. But stu- studies show that uh, kids are more compassionate as adults when their fathers take the time to invest in their lives. A 26-year study revealed fathers uh, were, were more compassionate. It said par- parental involvement was the single strongest parent-related factor in adult emp- empathy. The study said the father's influence is quite astonishing. The psychologist Richard Cosner of Magill University, Montreal, he said dads who spend the most time with their kids at least more than twice a week giving baths Meals, basic care, reared the most compassionate adults. Spending time with your kids, particularly when they're young. Getting involved in their lives. And, and, it, and it impacts them for years. Good and for bad. You can have a legacy that goes either way. Consider the legacy of one man. The na- his name was Jonathan Edwards. He's well known for as a, a preacher who did the infamous sermon Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Because of his sermons, he helped launch one of the great revivals in our country. He was the, the president of Princeton University, an author, a pastor. He, he had his hands in a lot of different things. He, him and his wife had 11 children. And of his known descendants, more than 300 became pastors, missionaries or theological professors. 120 became professors at various universities. 110 became attorneys. 60 became prominent authors, 30 became judges, 14 served as presidents of universities or colleges, three served in the U.S. Congress, and one became vice president of the United States from one man's legacy. And Jonathan Edwards was a very busy man. He got up early in the morning. He would travel. This is back when they were on horseback. So he'd travel as an itinerant speaker. He was known to work 13 hours a day, but he always made sure and came back to spend at least an hour a day investing in his kids because he knew how important it was. Let me ask you, what kind of legacy are you leaving? That's a fair question to ask yourself. And it's never too late to change. C.H. Spurgeon said this, and I quote, he said, a good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you. So carve, you, carve your name in hearts and not in marble. So you have a chance to carve your name on somebody's heart when you're a mentor. Now in Ephesians chapter 6, a word to the fathers. It says there, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So it says there, do not provoke your children to anger. That word provoke just means through our, our uh, continued uh, habits or behavior, we incite this, this resentment, this anger that bubbles over in kids. Now, there's a lot of ways that can happen, but I, I want to just direct your attention to two. First of all, When we show favoritism, showing favoritism of one child over another child. And I am surprised at how often I hear dads talk about this. They'll say, you know, I get it. You know, sometimes uh, a a kid is easier to connect with. They laugh at your jokes and their temperament is more in line with yours. And they like sports like you like sports or whatever. But that's a very dangerous thing to promote favoritism in your family. It causes resentment. We all know the story of, of Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac had his, they had two kids, right? They had two kids and they were twins. They were, they were womb mates, <laughs> right? And they, they, but Isaac really connected with Esau. Esau was an outdoors guy, hunter. You know, he's a great hunter. He could cook up a mean leg of venison, And then when they're eating it, you know, they're, "Mm, meat. this is good. You know, bonding moments. Esau and Isaac, they were like connected. And 
he was clearly the favorite. He made it real clear when he was time to pray. He would pray differently. I mean, he just, everything about it, he was, showed favoritism. On Rebecca, though, her favorite was Jacob. Jacob was different. He was like the outdoors, but he was a shepherd and he had just a different temperament. You know what happened? Because of the favoritism their parents showed, they, the brothers despised each other. And that went all the way into adulthood. It's destructive. Jacob then, when he becomes an adult and, and a parent, a father, you know what he does? He shows favoritism. Where do you think he got that? It's a legacy, right? That was the legacy that was poured into his life. So he has 12 sons. He has a favorite, right? Joseph. You know, he gathers his kids around. Hey, I, I wanted to, you know, I decided to make a coat for my favorite son. Gave him this beautiful coat. Think all the brothers said, he deserves that. He's a guy, great guy. No, you know, they, they get all upset, right? In fact, they, they plot and they decide, that they sell him into slavery. And then the Bible specifically says they take that coat. You're not getting that coat, buddy. And then they shred it up, put blood in it. It's part of the plan, but I think it's part, it says something about the favoritism. And listen, fathers, if you do that, if you say, well, you know, why can't you be more athletic like, your brother, you know, and why can't you, what are you, a wimp? What's your problem? Why can't you get the grades like Susie? You know, she, it's, you have the same classes. What, are you stupid? Listen, these things, they get inside a kid and they cause destructive behavior. And so it provokes them to anger. And the Bible says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't go down that way. Number two, another way, that you can provoke kids from anger and don't do that is, is by, by uh, not complimenting them enough. Rarely or never complimenting them. Proverbs 18, 21, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit you choose. And so you verbally, not just thinking it, boy, I like that kid. No, you, you, you say it. You verbally speak it out. Now, you don't need to say things that aren't true. That's all that's going to do is give them a false sense of confidence and will cause them trouble in life. They'll think that they have these, you know, these abilities that they don't have. Like what I'm, talking, I'm talking about balance, but I'm talking about making sure that you're not just on the corrective side of it. You're giving lots of compliments. You're looking for moments and opportunities to speak life, life-giving words into them. And that can be very, very powerful. So the Bible says, don't provoke your child to wrath. That's the negative. The positive is instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's mentoring, mentoring. So let me give you three ways to do that. Number one is be affectionate. Be affectionate. Thessalonians, Paul talks about this. He says, instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives as well. For you know that we dealt with each other, with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So Paul uses this metaphor of a nursing mother on how men, how fathers are to care for their Children, now he's talking about his love for, for the Thessalonians, but it, it, it absolutely applies to how fathers are supposed to actually show their kids encouragement and comfort and care for their kids, not just fall in the correction department. Now, it's easier to show kids this comfort and this encouragement when they're little. You know, they're two or three. They love to snuggle. It's all fun. It's harder when they become teens. You know, it's harder when in certain seasons of life. And granted, it's going to look different. But we still take that as our mentoring job. We say, I want to be somebody who's speaking life into my kids. Paul says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God. And so it is our spiritual responsibility to share the gospel of God. That's part of, what, that's part of mentorship. It's not just mom's job. Often that's, it's like mom takes care of that department, you know? She's the one who says, okay, it's time to get out of bed. Let's go to church. Oh, maybe we should pray about that. Let's read the Bible. All those, no, that's not mom's job. That, the Bible says that that is our job. 
That's part of what it means to be a mentor. Is that you spearhead that. It's not, you don't just wait for somebody else to come up with that idea. And you grow in that area. You have to realize that it's, it's serious stuff. Listen, if somebody broke into your home and was threatening to harm your wife and your children, what would you do? You would defend them, right? Well, of course you would. Well, listen, somebody is trying to get into your home. It's Satan. He's trying to harass you, destroy, to kill. He's, he's out for no good for your home. And so if you just sit idly by and do your own thing, it's as good as letting that robber come in and, and, hurt, and hurt your family. And so you pick up, the Bible says, the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word, and you start reading it. You start praying it. You start giving leadership and giving mentorship there. It's, a, it's an important responsibility that we all have. Number two is if you're going to be a good mentor, you be consistent. Paul says, we're delighted to share with you the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So it's important that we share the gospel, we share God's truth with, with our kids, but that's not enough. I mean, if, if you talk about God and then you live intentionally like a different way than that, that's, that's even more harmful. It's bad not to talk and point your kids to the Lord. It's worse to talk about God and then live in contradictory ways. You got to keep a short list when you make mistakes, as we all do. I certainly do. You go and you talk to them about it. You apologize. You, you, for, you ask for forgiveness. You, 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 you confess. And that helps keep things authentic. Because it's very important how we live. First Peter 3, 1 says, your godly lives will speak to them better than any words. That's true, right? It's true for us. Certainly true for young kids, little ears and that are listening. Will Rogers said it this way. He said, live in such a way that you would not be afraid to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. <laughs> and we can't really mentor any further than we ourselves have come. So we have to make a commitment. Say, I'm going to stay committed. I'm going to get involved. That's one of the, and you look for opportunities to do that. It's part of the reason we do offer things like the regional conference. So you step up, you go, that's something I'm going to get involved in. You know, sure, I have to, you know, give up some nights, maybe give up some days, do whatever it takes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get involved in that. And, you, get, and you, you step up and you say, that's part of mentoring because I can't take people where I myself have not gone. So I have to be willing to grow in those areas. Andrew Murray said, the secret of home rule is self-rule, first being ourselves what we want our children to be. So we have to be willing to commit to that area and say, I'm going to grow in that area. Third is be available. Be available. Moses says to the Israelites, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. And when you lie down and when you get up. Sounds like the dead spend a fair amount of time. When you lie down, when you get up, when you walk along the road. There's, there's kind of there's this myth that all we need today with our kids is quality time. We don't need quantity time. Just make sure it's quality time. And really quality time is just... A good excuse means you can pursue whatever hobbies or interests or careers, whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter because as long as you carve out a little bit of quality time. But you know, relationships don't really work like that. You know, I mean, have you ever scheduled like an hour meeting with somebody who you, you know, it's time to like grow in your relationship? You say, we only have an hour, but it's quality time. You know, it's just just us. You know, let's, let's go right at it. Well, it just doesn't work like that, right? It's in quantity that quality is found when you spend time with people and certainly spending time with your kids. You spend time with them and out of that opportunities, moments, teachable moments, mentoring moments come up and you can speak into that. That is particularly true as they get older. They become harder sometimes to speak into their lives. They become more defensive, more closed. 
You go, Andy, you're being hard on me. I'm busy. You're just a preacher. All you do is speak for a couple hours on a weekend. Then you lay around all day for the rest of the week. <laughs> if I had a life like you, hey, listen, I wish it was like that. But the truth is I'm actually very busy as well. We, we're, most of us live very busy lives. So it means it's a sacrifice to take time out to when you think through your goals in life. That becomes an important goal. Say, I, I, I'm going to give a, a big chunk of my time in this, in this endeavor of parenting, of fathering. And you look for opportunities to, to do that. And it's more than, I mean, we're thankful to be able to put on our kids program, our entrance youth program. We, 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 we come alongside parents, but the primary responsibility is upon you as a parent. That you step up to the plate, you say, I'm going to do it. And remember to not, when things get difficult, you, you stay in. It's, everybody is tempted at, at different periods of time. When you say, I can't take it anymore, it's easier for me to leave. And then you look for an exit plan. I want to tell you this story about uh, this teenage girl. She wrote a word picture to her to her dad. Her dad had left her mother for another lady. And so she, this is her true story, but she writes this story as a word picture to talk to her dad. She writes this. She says, Dear Daddy, it's late at night and I'm sitting in the middle of my bed writing to you. I've wanted to talk with you so many times during the last few weeks, but there was never any time when we were alone. Dad, I realize that you are dating someone else and I know that you and mom may never get back together and that's terribly hard for me to accept, especially knowing that you may never come back home or be an everyday dad to my brother and me again. At least I wanted you to understand what is going on in our lives. Don't think mom asked me to write this because she didn't. She doesn't even know I'm writing it. I just want to share with you what I've been thinking. I feel like our family has been riding in a nice car for a long time. You know, the kind that you always like to have as a company car. The kind that had the extras inside and no scratches on the outside. But over the years, the car has developed some problems. It's smoking and the wheels wobble and the seat covers are ripped and it's really hard to drive or ride in because of all the shaking and the squeaking. But you know what, Dad? It's still a great car. Or at least it could be with a little work. It could run for some more years. Brother Brian and I have always been in the back seat and you and mom have always been in the front. We always felt secure when you were driving and mom was beside you. But last month when you left, mom had to take over at the wheel. It was nighttime and we had just turned the corner and suddenly we looked up and saw another car coming at us out of control, heading straight for us. Mom tried to swerve out of the way, but the other car smashed into us and the impact sent us flying off the road, crashing into a light post. The thing is, Dad, just before we hit, we saw it was you driving the other car. And we saw someone else sitting next to you and it was that other woman. It was such a terrible accident, we were all rushed to the emergency ward. And we were asked where you were. Nobody seemed to know. We are still not really sure where you are in all of this, if, or if you are hurt. Did you need help? Mom was really hurt, Dad. She was thrown into the steering wheel. She punctured a lung, and it almost pierced her heart. So then it wrecked, and the back door smashed into Brian, and he was covered with cuts from broken glass. And his arm was shattered, and he is now in a cast. He's still in so much pain and shock that he doesn't want to talk or play with anybody. As for me, I was thrown from the car and stuck out in the cold for a long time, and my right leg was broken. As I lay there, I couldn't move, and I didn't know what was wrong with mom or Brian, but I was hurting so much myself, I couldn't help them at all. There have been times since that night that I wondered if any of us would make it. 
And even though we're getting a little better, we're all still in the hospital. The doctor says, I need some therapy on my leg and I know they will help me get better. But daddy, I wish it was you were helping me instead of them. The pain is so bad, but what is worse is we miss you so much. Every day we want to see if you're going to visit us in the hospital and every day you don't come. I know it's over, but my heart would explode with joy if somehow I could look up and see you walk into my room. At night, when it's really quiet, they push Brian and me into my mom's room. And all we do is talk about you and how much we all love driving with you and how much we wish you were back. Are you all right? Are you hurting from the wreck? Do you need us like we need you? This little girl, it's a true story. Her name is Kimberly. She wrote this letter. And within a few days, she was in her bedroom. She came down and in her kitchen, her dad had returned and was, they were starting to work on their marriage again. The reason I tell you this, this, uh, this word picture is because it's tempting to throw in the towel. And you can look around, all around you, and you can get advice. I hear it all the time. People come to me. They go, yeah, well, people at work told me this. Everybody thinks I'm crazy but you, pastor, <laughs> for staying in this when I'm so miserable. I'm telling you, yeah, sure, you'll, you'll get plenty of voices out there that tell you it's easier to leave and that you're stupid to stay. I tell you that you are a hero to stay, that God wants you to be a mentor and that he will help you if you, if you, if you trust him. If you say, God, I'm going to stand in here. I need your help. I need your strength. He will help you. I'm going to ask the fathers to stand right now. And I want to pray over you. If you're a father, in fact, all the men, just stand because you might be a father someday. Yeah, let's applaud them. Thank you. You're my hero. You stay in. And even if you maybe have made mistakes in the past, maybe you've made, just stay standing. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe you've made mistakes in the past. Maybe you've done some of the things we talked about. Who hasn't done some? Starts today. Today you say, I'm going to be a mentor. I can't change my past, but I can certainly decide about my future and my present. Let's pray. Father, I just pray right now over every, every man that's in this, in this place. I pray, Lord, for your leading for them, that they wouldn't do it in their own strength, but they would learn to trust in you, to listen to you. I pray for the fathers who were not the fathers they should have been. Lord, I pray against guilt and shame and condemnation and all of those things. That's from the enemy. God says he, he gives you a fresh start. Don't go looking back like that. That's not going to help. From this point forward, be courageous. And Lord, I pray for open hearts that the Lord's healing balm of grace would cover the pain or the shame or whatever the enemy meant for evil, God, you would use for good like you did for Joseph. Lord, I pray for the men who did not have good fathers. Maybe they're absent or maybe they were not good to them. Lord, I pray that that wouldn't get, they wouldn't, that legacy would be broken. The Bible calls that kind of stuff a curse. And so in Jesus' name, Father, I just break that curse over any man who was raised in that kind of home. That does not have to be your life or your legacy. And Lord, I pray for those who have lost their fathers, particularly recently, to bring your comfort, to help them to remember the good, the good things, a life well spent. Lord, I pray for every father, every grandfather, every great-grandfather. Help us, Lord, to be the fathers that you've called us to be. Lord, you know we feel inadequate. 
We certainly are overwhelmed at times. Thank you for your example. Help us up again and again when we fail. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.